Okay, welcome. Um, so here is the somewhat clickbaity title of my talk. But uh, since you all made it here, um, I can now add some qualifications to make this a little bit more reasonable. So first of all, I'm going to talk about GraphQL, but this, uh, this uh, question here I think is, uh, also applies to other kinds of API uh, technologies that are challenging the status quo uh, of uh, using REST for all APIs. Um, and also, uh, of course, uh, REST is a very powerful paradigm and it has been really useful and works really well. So I by no, in no way, shape or form mean that we will stop using it. But I think that the dominance of REST as the uh, main paradigm for building APIs will be challenged. So let's take a look at this. But first, uh, I would like to introduce myself. So my name is Joachim. You can uh, follow me on Twitter and see or hear me rant about things. And you can also check out my code on GitHub. Um, currently, I'm uh, leading uh, what we call Team Shopper at a uh, Swedish startup called uh, Rap. Uh, that means uh, I'm uh, responsible for building mobile applications for our service and also the APIs that power this mobile application. And in our case, this also means uh, figuring out how to talk to the rest of our backend, which also is powered by APIs. So we are like taking APIs, translating them to APIs, and sending them, them to an app. So I deal with the APIs all day long. Uh, all right. One more thing uh, I would like to tell you about myself is that I am really interested in languages. My background is in computational linguistics. Uh, and uh, yeah, languages fascinate me. So how, how many of you have seen this picture before? This is... Uh, Nobody? Huh? Uh, well, anyway, this is from a very famous uh, paper in linguistics uh, by a gentleman called uh, Worf. And uh, the hypothesis that he's trying to uh, 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 find some support for in this paper is, is now referred to as the Sapir-Worf hypothesis. And the idea here is that language influence thought. And he's trying to prove it by showing that Eskimos has lots of words for snow, and that probably means they think of snow in a different way. For the record, I just checked, Swedish has 12 different words for snow, so maybe we also have this thing going on. Um, all right, but why is this relevant for APIs? So I think it's relevant because APIs are languages that we use to interact with, with a system. We have a conversation with a system. And if you then think about the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which is that language will structure our thinking, then you could say that this also applies to APIs. So uh, uh, the way we design our APIs, structure the way we think about the tools we build and the applications we build. So therefore, this is relevant. All right, so let's take a look at REST. So we heard a nice, we have heard plenty of talks uh, these uh, two days about what REST is and how that applies to things and how you should think about things. But just really quickly, so the basic concept here is that everything is a resource. You have nouns, uh, that's like the stuff you're talking about, that's the resources. They are represented by, by uh, uh, URAs uh, in, in REST. And then you can do stuff with these resources. So you have verbs. So you have like, you do things with resource. That's like the basic idea in REST. OK, so this is uh, uh, really awesome, especially if you combine this with, with uh, uh, Hatios. I'm not sure how to pronounce this in a reasonable way. But uh, anyway, we heard a very nice talk yesterday how this it can be a very good way to create a self-descriptive API where you can just uh, traverse the, the graph of, uh, uh, of links and find out everything you could ever want to know about an application. So this is a... Uh, uh, this is a very powerful way to build, build your application because uh, it's really scalable and uh, your clients can be really simple and it's, it's great stuff. So uh, why would you want to change this? I mean, there are lots of advantages in REST. Uh, okay, so two things happened. Uh, uh, we have uh, lots of mobile devices and we have lots of uh, social and very data-rich uh, applications uh, being produced. So this means for us as application developers that we now have very powerful clients and we have data that is changing all the time. So uh, this brings some new problems. Uh, one problem for mobile clients in particular is that uh, we now have the problem of, of uh, uh, round trip time because on a wireless network, this is a very big problem. And 
if you have an approach like uh, like Hedios, then you're going to have lots of round trips, and that means you're going to get a slow application. And if you have this uh, uh, super powered device that can like crunch billions of uh, uh, computations per second, and then you have to wait three seconds for your page to load. You're not going to be very impressed. So uh, you don't want this. Uh, to some extent, HTTP2 could take care of this, but if you, especially if you're in the paradigm of, of HTTPS, then the assumption is that you need to fetch something to figure out what to do next. So even if you can do pipe planning, it won't really help, because you can't send off all of those requests at once anyway. All right, then you have the problem of over or under fetching. So this happens when you try to fetch something, but your REST API doesn't represent exactly what you need in your application. Uh, and to some extent, this just comes down to semantics. Are there, does the resources that you have in your REST API map to what you need? OK, and then my, my favorite topic here is, uh, is versioning here. So we have heard that you shouldn't do this. And uh, here is an example of why you shouldn't do this. Here is. Uh, well, you see, I've had, uh, just gone through our API gateway I described earlier. So we can see we're up to version 5 of certain uh, of these endpoints. Uh, I think the reason that it looks like this is not really about versions. I mean, what we're trying to do here is uh, describe different views on, on things. And we are just really bad at coming up with names. So we say, yeah, here's version 5. But actually, it meant include this field or de delete this field or something. So. Uh, here is a picture that shows you kind of how this looks like. With, with H2S, you have like a really thin client, really stupid one. It's a browser, you follow links, but in the new world, you have uh, bigger clients and maybe a smaller API layer. So let's take a look at GraphQL. GraphQL has the idea that everything is a graph, and GraphQL is a declarative query language. So uh, what does that mean? Declarative means you say what you want, and then you will get that. Hopefully, uh, the server will figure it out. So here's a very quick example of how this might look like. Uh, you see on the top you have, oh, this is kind of hard to read, but on the top you have the GraphQL query, and then you can see that back you get JSON that looks very much like what you asked for. And here's maybe a similar uh, uh, REST style request. So as you can see, the request for REST is much smaller, uh, but there are some advantages here. Uh, one thing that many people have missed is that GraphQL also does mutation, so uh, uh, you can you can modify your data with with GraphQL as well. It looks something like this. It's called a mutation. All right. So here's some sort of summary about what what are the pros and cons or like different approaches in GraphQL and REST. And uh, well, I mean, I think they both have their places, but uh, especially if you're building rich um, uh, uh, mobile-centric uh, uh, applications. I think GraphQL or something like GraphQL is a very good thing. All right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about language. In many ways, GraphQL is much simpler than REST because there are only two verbs. There is query, which you do most of the time, and then there is mutate. Then GraphQL on top of this has a very sophisticated type system. So uh, uh, I'm going to show you this. Uh, but just uh, when you heard declarative, that seems familiar, right? So if you've been doing any sort of backend work, you've probably done, done SQL. So SQL is also a declarative language. You say what you want, and you don't define exactly how you'll get it, but uh, the server will figure it out somehow. We'll do some crazy for loops and joins and look it up all over the place. And then what you get back is a table. So this is pretty cool, except most people don't think in terms of tables. So uh, in, in uh, GraphQL, what you get back is like a tree structure that, that represents the stuff that, you, that uh, you're asking for. So this, this can be much easier for an application developer to think about. OK, and then, well, most of the coding samples in GraphQL, they use the JSON because that's very convenient. But I mean, technically, uh, GraphQL just describes a tree structure. So anything that can be represented as a, a tree structure can be used as a GraphQL uh, response uh, uh, transport. So you could have HTML, you could have XML, or whatever you want. But most people use JSON because it's convenient. Uh, another thing to consider is that the selectors in GraphQL, they can be considered a path. They are, they are path to the entries that you look at in, in uh, uh, in your JSON document. So maybe maybe if you had your REST API structure so that every field had its own resource, it would be kind of similar to, to GraphQL. But that would be insane, of course, because you would have so many round trips. But uh, yeah, in GraphQL, you don't pay for the round trips, so that's fine. OK, now I'm going to try to do a very quick demo. So uh, you can check this demo out if you go to this address. 
And hopefully this demo will work. I'm just going to tell you what it is about. So we are at an API conference, and uh, we have this awesome uh, uh, schedule here. We can see what's going on. Um, I figured it would be cool to have an API for this, right? So I built one. Uh, let's take a look at how that looks. Uh, here is, OK, let's, let's launch it first. Might be a good idea. So here's the code. You launch it like this. Bam, it loaded 89 talks. Great. Uh, it works. So uh, here is, this is GraphQL. This is, uh, uses the power of uh, schema introspection in, in, uh, in GraphQL. So this tool is like a web interface that fetches the schema and gives you like a nice interface for, for talking to your, your new uh, GraphQL API. All right, so let's take a look. What do we have here? Maybe we have some speakers. Yes, we have speakers. And who, who am I? Let's see if we get some information about me. So we did. Great. Uh, maybe you want to know something more about me. Maybe you want to know my Twitter handle. Then you can add it like this. Um, as you can see, I get type ahead and everything you, you could ever want here. You do this, company. OK, I get my company. Great. And there is even a descriptive text there about me. So here you can read all about me in a nice JSON structure. OK, that's cool. Uh, but there was some other stuff on this page, right? So there were some talks, right? Uh, they probably have titles. Let's see. OK, cool. Lots of talks. Great. Uh, but I wonder when they are. So let's add the time. OK, we have the time. So this is kind of how you can work with, with uh, GraphQL. You, as a client developer, you have access to everything you could ever want, but you only get the things you ask for. And it's, uh, it's really cool. OK, I'm going to do one final thing here. So let's see who is doing the speaking in these talks. And we have to spell correctly. All right, this is going to take a bit longer. And the reason this is going to take a bit longer is something I'm going to tell you. So there were no speaker for the registration, but here we had some speaker. So pretty nice, right? So how does, this, how does the code for this look? Uh, so since I didn't find any like real API for, for this, uh, I, I built my own. So uh, uh, I, here is well. Here is the full source code. It's less than 100 lines of uh, JavaScript. That's pretty nice. So we uh, did start off by just going to the talks page and finds the entries that contains the information about the talks. Then I have this function that finds information about speaker. But then the GraphQL relevant stuff is here. So here I have defined the types that are available here. We have a query. This is like the top level thing. Things you can ask for. You can ask for me. You can ask for a specific speaker. And you can ask for talks. And then, then we describe here. What is a speaker? Speaker has this field. What is a talk? Talk has these fields. OK, cool. How do you get these things? Uh, so we, 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 we fetch the data into these data structures. Uh, but uh, the way it actually works is that, uh, for example, when you ask for me, then it scrapes a specific speaker. In this case, it's me. Um, uh, when, but when you ask for talks, it just returns the talks. This is, this is uh, just a variable that I just stuck all the talks into. So, so uh, the way the way you code in the backend is that you you provide a function for every every field that you you, you want to expose, and you uh, well code whatever you need there. This might be a SQL query or might be a call to an underlying backend service or it could be anything. Um, okay, so demo demo done. It worked. I'm very happy. Uh, let's see if I can get back to my talk. Um, all right, so let's talk about GraphQL and the future. Uh, so the one reason that we're using GraphQL uh, in, uh, at uh, RAP is because we have a very, uh, uh, you could say, extreme microservice architecture. We have more than 100 microservices running in our, in our backend. And then, well, my job is then to talk to all these uh, services. Uh, and uh, well, this is, gets unwieldy, of course. And GraphQL is really useful for us to be able to get some sort of order in this. Because what we do for our clients at the moment is that we provide these views that you can see with all the version numbers. And we have started using GraphQL for, for providing these views. We will also be exposing it to, to our clients directly. But for now, this is what we're doing. Um, so I think if you have anything like this, I think it's a great way to kind of aggregate stuff from lots of different places. OK, uh, another thing I've been experimenting with, which uh, sounds maybe even more crazy, is to uh, stick GraphQL into your application as a library. And then you have all your resolvers baked into your application. So this is cool because uh, 
it gives you the same kind of uniform API access to all the stuff in your backend, but you don't have to do the round trip over the GraphQL server. So I discussed this a bit with, uh, with uh, uh, Lee Byron, the, the author of uh, most of GraphQL, and he thought this was crazy. So I think that's a great reason for, for doing more in this direction. All right. So let's talk about the open web. So one big problem, as we heard, uh, if that uh, GraphQL doesn't have links. So it's kind of hard to figure out, to get all the data out of a GraphQL-powered API. Uh, it, uh, you cannot crawl it, uh, but you do have a schema. So I don't know, maybe, maybe it's, uh, well, maybe that, uh, that uh, will uh, uh, help you do something like crawling anyway, but it will certainly not work in the same way as you can do now. So this is kind of a challenge. It also challenges the whole idea of linking. I mean, how do you link into a graph? Or I, I, I said earlier that you could see these things as paths. Maybe you could create a URI that that corresponds to GraphQL uh, paths somehow. Uh, I haven't seen anybody do that, but I think that would be interesting. Um, OK, and then another thing I think would be a great fit for GraphQL is, is open data. Because open data, it's very common that it's like lots of different data points that you, you need to access in different uh, kind of ways. And probably you want to aggregate them. I mean, we heard about the bus API. Probably you would want to aggregate that with some other, like, more geolocation API or something like this. Uh, so then it would be cool if you had that available like in one structure so you could look, aggregate something. And this brings me to what I think would be a pretty good, cool direction for using GraphQL. And that's like an aggregator proxy for lots of different uh, APIs. This would be especially simple, of course, if these are exposed through REST APIs because, well, it's really simple to build uh, REST backends for a GraphQL uh, API. So. Uh, yeah, this is something I would like to see more of, and I would like to play around with it. Uh, all right, so uh, that brings us back to the title of the talk. And like I said, with some qualifications, I think, yes, uh, I think GraphQL and uh, some of its uh, friends uh, will, will mean that we will be challenging, especially the, the hate EOS aspect of RESTful uh, API thinking. Uh, and uh, uh, well, I also think there will be a lot more innovation in this direction. I mean, uh, in many ways, GraphQL is just one of the different ideas uh, that could help solve some of these problems that I pointed out earlier. But uh, it's certainly not the only one, and it's certainly not, not uh, perfect. I do think it's the best one as of now. It's very well specified and very nice. So yeah, go play around with it. It's great. That's it.